Tylo is the biggest moon of the biggest planet in the Kerbal system. However, that's not what makes it unique. Every gravity giant in KSP has one thing in common, atmospheres. Typically, the atmosphere's density scales with the planet's size, which is why landing on planets like Eve or even Kerbin is fairly easy and straightforward. However, even though Tylo is nearly as massive as Kerbin and larger than Lave, it has no atmosphere. This makes Tylo especially challenging to land on, since any craft descending to the planet's surface would need to do so entirely with engine power. In fact, Tylo's landing burn is so costly that it actually requires more Delta V to land on Tylo than to get to it from Kerbin's LKO. So, keeping all that in mind, clearly the most reasonable thing to do now is to build a single launch Tylo Mega Base. The build process started with the base itself. Sadly, there is still no mining or science in KSP2, so there isn't anything that we really need to include in our base. Instead, what I'm trying to do here is to simply make it look cool while keeping the parts count down to a reasonable degree. Since we will be landing on Tylo, we will also need to include dedicated landing engines for the final burn. Vectors are naturally the best choice for such a task. The base itself ended up coming in at 355 tons and 275 parts. It's approximately 15 stories tall, while having space to house 221 kerbals. After adding a few finishing touches, like struts and lights, it was time to tackle the rocket itself. Since our base engines are purely for the landing, we'll need to include an interplanetary service module. Hydrogen is an absolute lifesaver here. Since hydrogen is extremely power dense, it allows us to cut down on the weight drastically, basically making this mission possible. This brought our total payload mass to approximately 550 tons. Our orbital insertion rocket was split into two main stages. The upper stage comprised of four skipper engines flanking a single mammoth. This stage's only job is to finish the circularization burn. Most of the heavy lifting will be done by our first stage, which is truly massive. It's comprised of a central main booster, which has 19 vectors, along with six secondary boosters, which have five vectors each. This brought our total first stage engine count to a staggering 49 vectors. After adding a billion struts, our total mass and part count has also swelled to nearly 2.7 megatons and 626 parts. But I'm sure it's going to be fine. Right guys? Now guys, don't mistake what you're seeing on screen for the game running well. I can assure you that 49 vectors running at the same time absolutely tank your FPS. However, that's only part of the story. When FPS drops so low, the game engine has to slow down to have adequate time for all the physics calculations. This meant that, in my case, every 1 second of in-game time is roughly about 5 seconds IRL. This made controlling the rocket really difficult. It also didn't help that the build was extremely wobbly. Due to those two factors, I had very little control over the rocket in its first stage. Thankfully, it was pretty stable on the following prograde, so what I did was initiate a pretty gentle gravity turn and let the rocket do its thing in prograde. Fortunately, once we jettisoned the first stage completely, most of the wobbling seemed to have gone away. This meant that I actually had pretty decent control for the final orbital insertion burn. After we complete our extremely lengthy takeoff and orbit burn, it will be time to start making our way to Jewel. However, since we are transporting a pretty heavy payload, there was just no way of engineering enough Delta V into the craft while maintaining playable FPS. This meant that we will need to perform a series of gravity assists around Duna to reduce our total delta V requirements for the mission. The tool I used to plot gravity assists is MG Planner. According to its calculations, we want to leave on year 1, day 321 to get our first Duna gravity assist. After roughly matching our periapsis to what the tool indicated and executed another pretty lengthy burn, we could start our gravity assist chain. In total, it ended up taking us 5 Duna gravity assists to raise our periapsis enough to reach Jules orbit. Sadly, these gravity assists were even more time consuming than usual. Even though KSP-2 now displays trajectory lines in a different sphere of influence, it still doesn't displace trajectory lines past them. 
This meant that I had to eyeball the effectiveness of my gravity assists. In addition, I couldn't tell if I was approaching the planet on the correct side to increase her periapsis rather than decrease it. And by dumb luck, I got every single one of those 5 gravity assists wrong and set up encounters on the wrong side of the planet. This meant that I basically had to do every encounter twice, needing to revert to a quick save and change my approach angle after every attempt. After several hours of gravity assist purgatory, we finally raised our periapsis enough to reach Jules' orbit. Once Jules moved into a good position for us to intercept, we plotted another burn and set up a Jules and later Tylo encounter. After arriving at Jules' sphere of influence, our Tylo encounter was, of course, gone since our trajectory randomly changed, just like in the single rapier video. Now, we won't be landing on Tylo with the very first encounter. We simply don't have the delta V required to circular ice coming straight out of deep space. Instead, what we need to do is to use Tylo's gravity well to reduce our speed and put ourselves into a low energy jewel orbit. This took a couple of attempts, since our trajectory past Tylo was completely wrong, so I had to do this by trial and error. After waiting for another Tylo encounter, we executed a small burn and were finally on our way to land. Once at Tylo, we executed a lengthy burn to place ourselves into a low orbit. Since we had some excess delta V, I decided to spend some of it changing our orbital inclination to get a better landing spot. And now, it was finally time to land. The landing itself wasn't especially difficult just time consuming. Each landing attempt took about 10 minutes to complete since I couldn't go into non-physical time warp for the suicide burn. In addition, Tylo's surface isn't very smooth and we have a very tall lander with relatively narrow legs. Which meant that some landing attempts had to be scrapped since the base would topple over if we landed on uneven terrain. I also wanted to get a pretty efficient burn, which meant that I had to do several mock landings to fine-tune our engine startup timings. Honestly, the hardest part of the whole landing was keeping the camera in frame. Camera angle seems to drift a little over time in KSP2, and even though that's not an issue most of the time, when you're performing a 10 minute burn, drift can be a bit of a problem. But yeah guys, this was the story of how I got a mega base all the way to Tylo with just a single launch. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. As always, I'm Carmen Von Brown and I'll see you in the next one.